Twitch. This is a DMCA free playlist from Spotify. DMCA free. Welcome, welcome. Hope you're having a great day. Can you hear the music in the chat? Nice. How you doing, Yuhan? Good. Good seeing you, Yuhan. chat soon. Let me just check something. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, testing. How's the audio level, Yuhan? Audio is good? Oh, that's, that's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Twitch site because my Streamlabs isn't updating the number of viewers. I don't know if other people are here, but right now it just says one. Oh, I see two. Hey, Lucas. Hey, uh, I, I don't want to mispronounce the name. Is it uh, Jiarong? Uh, it must not be accurate then. Yes? Hey, welcome. Good seeing you. Okay, I'm going to switch over pretty soon. <clears throat> This is all DMCA free Twitch, so don't uh, don't give me a strike. DMCA free playlist. I have my mic on a different setting right now. Does the audio come through clearly? Okay, now it's updated and says seven of you are in here. 
I have it on this uh, setting that I think is supposed to capture kind of more ambient sound. I don't know. I never know. The audio confounds me sometimes, but I think it's because I, I really want it to sound good. <clears throat> All right, if you're just waking up, hope you have your tea, coffee, something to give you that energy. We're going to get into it today. Today is uh, the start of our kind of theoretical jump into learning about martial arts, bringing a sociological sensibility. What does that mean? Let's find out together. All right, I'm going to switch to this screen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let me turn off this Spotify list. Welcome. Um, I'm also going to now uh, begin, if you're unable to connect via Twitch, I'm going to start the uh, Zoom room as well. Um, you have your choice. Twitch is a uh, much easier platform to use. But uh, yeah, you can use this one too if you want. All right, let me see. Put that up. And it should be good to go. Welcome. How's everybody doing on this? Uh, let me see. I'm going to put this back onto the podcasting setting. So this should be the default for kind of speaking. Good. Nice. Let's get a quick check in in the chat. Um, let's say, let's say you're stranded on a desert island, or not in the desert island. That's like almost a contradiction. You're stranded on an island. What's a what's one book that you're gonna take with you on that trip, that involuntary trip? I think for me. Hmm, that's a tough one, actually. I asked a question that I think I have a hard time answering. I would, it would have to be a big book, something also enjoyable to read. That's a tough one. Lucas, The Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, okay. Nice. Is that one of your favorite books? And Then There Were None, Raylix. Crazy Rich Asians, Tiffany. Welcome, welcome. Is the book better than the movie? It's a lot of fun and very long. Yeah, I've never actually read that, but I've heard about that book. Yeah, it would have to... The, the circumstances would mean that I almost feel like I would need something that's not super depressing. And unfortunately, a lot of the books I read are not fun reads. They're kind of depressing reads like one of the f books that i i like a lot is uh the road by cormac mccarthy which is like a dystopian post-apocalyptic novel about a father protecting his son from the elements but i feel like that would be almost too depressing so i'd probably need to think about it. a book that teaches survival skills nice yeah, that makes sense, Olivia. Yeah, so a, a, a handbook, uh, like a survivalist handbook. That's probably the smartest answer. The road made me cry a lot, LOL, says Lucas. Yeah, honestly, it did to me too, especially at the end. And uh, I haven't read it since I became a parent, but I think it would resonate differently now. Harry Potter, Deathly Hallows, nice. Something kind of, I think, I think to kind of, keep me in good spirits i would probably bring like a i like this um crime writer named elmer leonard he had a lot of his books turned into films and uh he's just very easy to read like breezy breezy reading and it's he, he usually there's usually some kind of like 
the plot usually involves some kind of like bank heist or double cross or some kind of conflict. Um, and there's like a little bit of humor. So I think I'd take with me maybe like a Elmer Leonard book because Cormac McCarthy might be a little too depressing for a situation like that. But welcome everyone. How's everybody doing on this on this uh, fine Thursday? Are you surviving the humidity? It's getting a little humid now. It really feels like summer. <clears throat> Loving the sun, says Sabrina. Yes, finally. I know. It's nice. It's very nice. I think um, this summer has felt very confusing because a couple of days ago or few, like earlier this week, it felt kind of like fall and now it's like summer again. Definitely hot in the corner where my computer is, but I'm surviving. AC is a must for today, says Andrew. Yeah. For sure. And I'm streaming out of uh, an upstairs office. So the temperature up here, not the best. Temperature in the basement is good, but I don't have this setup down there. So here we are. Well, anyways, wherever you are, I hope that you are having a good day. I hope that you're not uh, sweltering in the heat. Uh, we're going to talk about one of my favorite books today by a sociologist named Luik Vacant. The book is called Body and Soul, Notebooks of an Apprentice Boxer. I first encountered this book when I was in graduate school, um, and it got kind of a lot of publicity at that time. It was a book that really... people were sort of divided on. There was a lot of controversy um, because Vacant kind of starts out, he comes out swinging, not to use like a played out metaphor or anything, but he begins his book basically throwing down a little bit of a gauntlet and, say, and says on the very first page of The Taste and Ache of Action, right? He says, here, let me put this up. I'm going to try and like um, put this up on desktop. Okay, and then I'm going to put this over here and maybe zoom in a bit. No, that's too much. All right, can you all, can you, are the words big enough for you here? Can you all see the words? Yeah, okay, nice. Right here, right off the bat. So he's kind of describing what this book is going to be about. And he says, make, he drops kind of like to use a, I, I don't know, to, to, he, he, he kind of drops this big truth bomb right off the bat. He says, the fact that the social agent, aka people, is before anything else a being of flesh, nerves, and senses in the twofold meaning of sensual and signifying a quote unquote suffering being who partakes of the universe that makes him and that he in turn contributes to making with every fiber of his body and his heart. Sociology must endeavor to clasp and restitute this carnal dimension of existence, which is particularly salient in the case of the boxer, but is in truth shared in various degrees of visibility by all women and men through a methodical and meticulous work of detection and documentation, deciphering and writing libel to capture and to convey the taste and the ache of action, the sound and the fury of the social world that the established approaches of the social sciences typically mute when they do not suppress them altogether. What is Vacant saying here? One thing I'll say, Louis Vacant has a kind of poetic way sometimes of writing. So these are, he has these really long sentences at times. And um, sometimes it takes a little bit of deciphering and pausing to kind of digest all of the words that he's saying. But he kind of comes out swinging right off the bat. And what, what do you, how do you interpret 
this this opening? What's he kind of getting at here? Any sense? Anybody want to take a take a take a guess? What is what, what's he saying? Sociologists have failed to acknowledge. What have they ignored? And in doing so, right? He's kind of. I think trash talking is not maybe the fair way of describing it, but he's kind of he's kind of saying, "Look, everybody who participates in the construction of knowledge has failed to really look at something extremely important." Anybody have a sense of what he's what he's getting at. <laughs> Nobody, everybody's kind of thinking. Lucas says he's saying sociologists disregard physical bodies and the physical experiences in their study. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a it's a long winded way of kind of saying that, right? He's saying that let's break it down from the very beginning. He's saying people are beings made of flesh, of nerves and senses, right? That we can feel things um, and we can also our bodies also signify things to others. Um, so first and foremost, we have this corporeal reality, this connection to each other and the world that is mediated through our bodies, right? He's saying kind of like at a very ontological level, we are bodies first and foremost. Um, then he goes on to saying, we contribute we construct the world around us with our bodies, with every fiber of our body and heart, right? So the initial part of this is really just saying kind of um, a statement about people and our connection to the world. Um, in saying sociology has to bring this carnal dimension of existence back into the fold and that if... Uh, we ignore this, we kind of lose out on this really crucial dimension of our lived experience of, 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 what, of what life is like. Um, here he gets into kind of like the methods of how we do that. He says through a meticulous, methodical and meticulous work of detection and documentation, um, deciphering and writing liable to capture and convey the taste and ache of action, the sound and fury of the social world that the established approaches of social science is typically mute when they do not suppress them altogether. So um, another way of saying this, people ignore this just fundamental core part of our live reality. Um, and it's, it's to the detriment of the production of knowledge. We don't have this, there's a kind of black box, as it were, around um, our kind of embodied experience in the world. He then goes on to say on the next page, oh, sorry, wrong one. He then goes on to say the next page, to accomplish this, to bring the body back in, there is nothing better than initiatory immersion and even moral and sensual conversion to the cosmos under investigation, right? So we can't understand the body, embodiment, sensuality from afar. You can't sit on the armchair. You can't sit on high in the ivory tower and hope to theorize this. 
This is something where you have to kind of get out there and you have to do it. You have to not only participate in the phenomenon you're trying to explain. Um, he makes an even deeper claim here. He says that uh, it's not just about immersion, right? Which is kind of like the necessary condition for understanding. He says you, you even have to go a step further. Through the immersion, you need to have what he calls moral and sensual conversion to the cosmos under investigation. What do you think he means by that? Any, anybody have a sense of what, what's he mean by moral and sensual conversion to the cosmos under investigation? I'm not like a expert at all in French sociology, but um, I've been told by some colleagues that his way of writing has, that there's a, there, there's a little bit of that style that comes through in his writing. So Louis Vacant is from France, um, but he teaches and works in the United States at Berkeley. Um, so there's a lot of this kind of, it, it, there's like uh, moments where his prose kind of slides into like a humanistic style. Um, and some of it is very poetic, right? Um, it's not necessarily the way I write or other sociologists that I have worked with or learned from right, but there's a lot of interesting ideas. We just have to pull them. Olivia says, you need to partake in what you're investigating, not just be a passive observer. Yeah, exactly. He's saying sociologists should immerse themselves in these physical experiences to understand them. Exactly, Lucas. Exactly. Exactly. And it's... It's not just like you're doing something, you're not just physically participating in it for the sake of it. Um, he's saying you got to throw yourself in earnestly and really, really go for it. You really have to, um, the part about moral and sensual conversion means basically if you want to understand a phenomenon, you have to really, really get into it and you have to, um, let me see, adjust that. You have to become someone who, uh, to, to, to truly understand what it's like for others who are participating in this world, you have to become someone who um, thinks and believes like the people that you're with. And, um, you know, we can, we can discuss if you think that's possible, if that's something that the ethnographer can actually do, or if this is maybe overselling what... Uh, the researcher can do. But he's saying, like, if you really want to understand embodiment in the phenomena, the phenomenon that you're trying to get at, you got to first participate in it. You have to do what people are doing with your own body and experience and feel it for yourself. Secondly, um, and this comes from just the time you spend and the kind of uh, intention in what you're doing. You also have to go into it with the full idea that you're um, you're trying to learn and trying to do as they do right so let's let's kind of like build on that a little bit here I don't know why my mic keeps editing itself shouldn't be doing that so what are some let's think of let's brainstorm a little bit here so what are some activities? in the world that you think would be, he says boxing is kind of a, the obvious example. What are some other activities that are things that people do that would be very difficult to theorize and understand from afar? Right, I'll give you an example. I read, so I was a swimmer my whole life. I started swimming when I was like five. I then got into competitive swimming when I was seven. And then I started getting pretty good at swimming right around like 11 or 12. Um, I started, uh, you know, I had like different meets that I would win. And then um, by, t by the time I was like 13 and 14, I was nationally ranked in the US. And then I went to this high school where I was in a boarding program and swimming with other people from all around the world who were there to kind of swim. Um, 
And then I went to college and I swam. When I was um, swimming, I, I, I found this old manual from like the 1950s that kind of had pictures, these drawings of people swimming. And it had these words describing what you have to do to have efficient freestyle or crawl, as some people call it. And I remember reading that and thinking like, this can't possibly represent like the feel of swimming. Like there's something ineffable that's lost when we try to articulate it in these words. Um, so I felt this chasm between the kind of experiential side of swimming, of how the water feels on your hand and how your fingers kind of catch the water at the top of your stroke and how um, the, the feeling of tension when you have a good um, catch in your stroke, right? There's so much of that lost, right? So the, the, theor the theorizing of it and the description sometimes falls very short. Lucas says, sports in general, anything playing, like playing an instrument or sewing, yeah. Yeah, like can you imagine trying to write a treatise about sewing without actually sewing yourself and without actually, you know, even just like something so mundane, like being able to thread the needle through the little hole, right? Like if you've never done that, you can understand the kind of focus and concentration and um, physical agility you need to be able to do that. Olivia says, the experience of anyone who is disabled. Yes, exactly. Right? So like mun mundane things like standing up, getting ready, um, doing anything that requires um, movement. If you, if you don't have the full use of body parts, right, you compensate in ways that someone who is not um, living that way can't possibly understand. Dance, musical performance, exactly, Tiffany. So um, another example of where, like, you, you remember these old shows. This is way, way probably before your time. It was even before my time. But these old shows where they'd have, like, the manual and they put the little numbers on the ground with the feet, right? <laughs> it's like, if you want to learn how to do the cha-cha-cha or, like, the twist, these are the steps you have to take. And there would be these, like, little footprints where you have to step um, and people could visualize that and they could see it and they, they might even be able to try it out, right? But it's, it's, it's quite different than, than what he's describing as, what does he call it? Initiatory immersion, right? Of getting really into it and feeling it. There's a feel. Calligraphy, another great example, right? Like you can watch somebody do it. You can interview them and get an account of what it's like to do, but, um, the kind of softness of like the brush strokes of, of the angles of like how the, the brush kind of like moves across the canvas. Like there's so much that's lost when you don't actually feel it for yourself. Right. So I think you all get the point. These examples, by the way, fantastic because Vacant says from the very beginning, this book is about boxing. It's about uh, a fighting style, but the theoretical picture the takeaway is much bigger than just boxing and combat sports. It's a um, central part of our existence. So there's a, there's a deep, deep kind of existential theme here. And he's saying sociologists, social scientists. Yeah, he doesn't even say so sociologists. He says social sciences typically mute or suppress this kind of dimension of our experience altogether. It's missing. It's not there. We need to bring it in. So he's, this was written, I think, in 2003, about 20 years ago. And um, since then, he's really, I think, shaped the field of MMA studies. Um, there are a number of people who have come along. They did a special issue. In fact, I think they called it Fighting Scholars. And it was people who had uh, done different kinds of research on martial arts and embodiment. My student, Bridget Burke, who's a PhD candidate, has uh, used his work as well as a jumping off point into her ethnography. Hey, Kana, no worries. Welcome. Um, and since then, there have been many who have followed, but I still think, 
I'll make the argument that I don't think we have fully fulfilled the call. I think that there's still quite a bit to do. Some of you who may have taken my hip hop course um, know that I teach a class on breaking, on dancing. And the person that we read in that, in that class, Joseph Schloss, um, is not like a vacant scholar per se, but his, his uh, book where he becomes a break dancer, a breaker, and then writes about his experience and the experiences of others is also kind of in the same spirit, right? You can't understand something truly, truly, unless you really, really do it. And you're not just doing it once or twice superficially. Vacant is saying you have to kind of experience morally, spiritually, um, sensually a conversion. You got to really like, it has to become part of you. Like it can't just be something that you do passively. It has to be something that um, becomes ingrained in you in a serious way. And he says later on the next page, he says that, you know, this is also kind of building on the project that Pierre Bourdieu sets out. He says that, um, here, let me put this up. If it is true, as Pierre Bourdieu contends, that we learn by body and that the social order inscribes itself in bodies through this permanent confrontation, more or less dramatic, but which always grants a large role to affectivity, then it is imperative that the sociologist submit himself to the fire of action in situ, right? Which means like in the situation, in the moment. That to the greatest extent possible, he put his own organism, sensibility, and incarnate intelligence at the epicenter of the array of material and symbolic forces that he intends to dissect, right? So, there's a larger project he's building on. So we're building on Vacant. Vacant is building on Bourdieu. Bourdieu is saying that um, the social world inscribes itself in bodies, right? And it's imperative for us. If we really, really want to understand it, we have to kind of throw ourselves into the fire of action. It's a really beautiful way of kind of describing, um, you know, participating in the world that we're trying to understand, right? I like that, the fire of action. It's kind of um, poetic, but there's something very precious about that, he's saying. Um, you, you, you have to kind of submit yourself to that, right? Organism, sensibility, and incarnate intelligence, right? Embodied intelligence. You have to really, really throw yourself into the fire, right? So all of the things that you described, I'm going to go through some of them again just to kind of revisit them. Um, sports, as Lucas says. Disability, as Olivia says. Dance, as Tiffany says. Calligraphy, as Andrew says. Um, all of these things. Impossible to truly, truly grasp um, without that deep, deep embodied immersion. And now here's the catch. The catch is that Oh, yeah, that's the right one. The catch is that most people don't do this. And it, it, I don't have like a quantitative breakdown, but most ethnographers, most social scientists um, do not do carnal sociology. They don't participate fully in the world that they're trying to understand. And there's this kind of distance between doing and studying what they're trying to, the, the world that they're trying to understand and actually um, feeling some things that you can only feel. Now, let's go, I'm going to ask a kind of build a, a question that builds on what we talked about already, but what are some of these insights that you can't glean from afar from any of these kinds of physical activities or things that you, you mentioned previously? Like I mentioned in my example of swimming, right? Uh, you, the books, the little manuals on swimming, the little like tutorials, they can't, they can't really grasp the, um, ineffable feel of the water, right? When you're swimming, one of the things that you feel, if you take like two days off of swimming, um, you feel right away, you lose that there's a kind of special 
connection you have to the water that's felt in your hands. Every stroke requires some form of sculling where your hands are kind of like moving through the water at certain angles and then allowing you that, that, that allow you to kind of get a strong grasp on the water that allows you to, the, to move your hips, right? Um, the same is for backstroke, right? When you're on your back, like you, you reach like this little part of the stroke where your fingers are kind of like grabbing the water, right? You, you, the manuals can't really represent that in a good way. And in fact, even the words that I use are probably grasping at straws in some ways. So does anybody have like an example of that, of something that's kind of ineffable, physically ineffable, that's hard to kind of represent without you actually doing it, without being immersed, right? Without throwing yourself into the fire of action, into the fire. And this could be something else. It doesn't have to be one of the examples you shared, but maybe something from your own life. Like maybe there's something that, you know, it, it, it's just very hard to represent unless you actually do it. Like something very ineffable. I'll give another example. Uh, oh, we got one coming in. Describing a taste to someone who's never tried it. Yeah, that's a good one, right? So, you know, Vakant is talking about the body and embodiment. Um, and yeah, taste is a good one, Olivia. When running, the way it feels when you hit your stride. Yeah, exactly. So when you have that kind of like rhythm, right? There's a certain rhythm, a feeling where your body kind of like works automatically, maybe. I'm not a runner, but that's a great example. Like you can kind of like talk about it in abstract terms, but unless you felt it, you know, unless you felt the kind of pitter patter of your feet hitting the, hitting the ground or whatever surface you're running on and the, the way that your body kind of like propels itself through momentum, like you can't really grasp that, right? Taste is the same. Um, you always kind of feel this when, I don't know if any of you have ever been like wine tasting before. Has anybody ever been wine tasting? Like there's a lot of, interestingly, there's a lot of good wine tasting in Ontario. Um, it's kind of a little, little, Olivia has, no, kind of has not. Well, one thing that you do when you go, and Yuhan has not, they sometimes give you like a, wine to try and they say this pairs well with this type of food sometimes it's like cheese sometimes it's something else and then the sommelier or like the people who are kind of there talking about the wine like the experts have these little like paragraphs that describe the taste palette of different things and you know a lot of these things kind of help orient you and they sort of like highlight certain aspects of what it feels like to imbibe whatever wine or to consume whatever food you're having. But the reality of the feeling of it, the phenomenological reality of it is, is often a little bit different. There's something that's also missing, right? The words can only get you so far. Somebody else's kind of interpretation of that experience can only get you so far. There's something that's actually very precious and idiosyncratic and unique to your own embodied experience that is not easily represented in words. Um, and I think that's also kind of at stake here when Kant is talking about how we have to kind of throw ourselves into the fire. We're all going to have a very different reaction. Um, now he talks about this interesting kind of entree into this world, right? He says that, here, I'm going to put it back up on screen. This is on page, uh, well, nine, I guess, in the preface. There's no one universal experience. Exactly, Olivia. Perfect way to say it. He says, my first boxing training lesson, right? So he, 
He wants to study everyday life on the south side of Chicago in this neighborhood called Woodlawn, which is where he lives as a graduate student. He's trying to figure out a way to get in with people so that he can talk to them. And he has a friend. I found this interesting. I always miss this detail. Who A French friend who practiced judo um, who takes him to this boxing gym. All right. And he says that from his first boxing training session, I started an ethnographic diary without imagining for a second that I would attend the gym with increasing assiduity for three and a half years and in the process amass some 2,300 pages of raw notes by religiously consigning to paper for hours every evening, right? So he kind of like stumbles into this project. And I think that's also one of the interesting things about this book. This book has had a very prominent role in reshaping sociology, more specifically ethnography, right? This kind of gauntlet, uh, what he calls carnal sociology. To understand it, you must participate in it. You must throw yourself into the fire. Um, but he didn't start with this idea that this was going to be his project. He, he kind of saw this as a way in, as a strategic field site to start collecting data about the neighborhood. Um, but he starts to fall in love with fighting with with boxing it becomes something that he gets swept up in the emotions of like participating in this world of training of feeling his own body change right i think that's one of the if i had a subtle critique i would say that his book doesn't really get into that transformation right which is also part of what draws people to various kinds of sports and activities it's not just the social world that you're participating in. Like sometimes as sociologists, we can kind of like look at the world through that lens. We participate in things because we feel sense of community in them. That's true. And you, that comes through in some of his writing about being a member of the gym, of having camaraderie with people, of having his uh, trainer, Didi. He talks about very fondly throughout the book as almost like a father figure who looks out for him and other boxers. So part of the allure of being at the gym or being in any sport, some of the things that you all have mentioned, is the sense of community derived from it. But um, something that maybe is glossed in Vacant's account of boxing is the, the sense of gratification that he feels as his own body and his own senses are transforming, right? As he moves from being a novice, somebody who doesn't know how to even maybe tie his his shoes or put on the hand wraps or the gloves to then developing enough competency so that he can go at the end of the book where we're going to get to where he goes and competes in the golden gloves, right? Where he feels like he can throw combinations. Now he can take a punch. Like there's all this stuff that happens to him. He becomes hardened and more, um, uh, attuned to this world. Right. And he says, from the jump that there are three main challenges, the first of which is probably the most uh, real one. He says, he questions, would I be capable of learning this roughest and most demanding of sports? Right? So one of the, the first challenge he has to confront is, can he hack it? Can he survive? Can he make it through the training? Because it's not easy. It's physically, emotionally challenging, right? To train uh, your cardio to train, um, getting hit to, to harden yourself in a way where you can sustain the, the pressure of, of, of fighting of even, even in a kind of controlled setting, like he's taking punches to the body, right? Um, he also gets into later as part of his training, can he, can he hack it where he has to cut his life to the bone, right? He talks about how in the lead up to the fight, one of the big rituals amongst boxers is that they abstain from sexual relations. Um, they, they abstain from doing things that are going to drain the body, right? And there's all this sort of local sense making about how you have to prepare. It has to be almost like this monastic preparation, right? Where you're, you're not, um, do it. You're not living the same way you normally would live. You're cutting all of these things out, these distractions out, so that your your body is becoming fine tuned. Um, so it's challenging. Can he can he do it? The second 
The second theme, which we won't get into as much in this class, um, but we can certainly talk about it, he says, could I grasp and explain social relations in the black ghetto based on my embeddedness in that particular location? So the second challenge he has, which um, in all honesty becomes kind of a afterthought in some parts of the book, is can he use this field site? Can this field site yield insights into the broader neighborhood life and the lives of mostly young black men who hang out there and train there? And number three, Um, I don't know why this should be highlighted actually. <clears throat> then he writes, how to account anthropologically for practice that is so intensely corporeal, a culture that is thoroughly kinetic, a universe in which the most essential is transmitted, acquired and deployed beneath language and consciousness. What do you all think he means by this? Can you, how do you, how do you make sense of this part? What's this challenge really all about? We've kind of, we, uh, here's a hint. We've kind of already alluded to it, but here he's saying kind of out loud another one of the core challenges of this project. What's, what's at stake here? What's he mean here? How to communicate in writing, what he comes to understand. Yeah, exactly, Lucas. That's precisely it, right? He's already kind of aware of the ineffability of lived experience, of, of physicality, of his emotions. It's hard. It's very hard. And I, I think that this is something that anybody who goes this route is going to struggle with. And I'm going to, you know, as part of the assignments in this course, this theme will come up. I'm going to try to challenge you to think about um, what's lost when you try to put experience, experiential parts of your life into words, when you try to represent it into symbols and language that are intelligible for others, right? It's just something, there's something very profound that he's trying to get at here. And I think it's, 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 it's a very important, um, a very important kind of moment for sociology that we still are working through. I don't think we've really followed through on the promise or the, I don't think we've really responded to his call here, right? I'll give you another example. Um, I remember, so when I was in my freshman and sophomore year in college, I used to go to raves a lot. Like they were very popular back in those days in the Bay Area, like in San Francisco and Oakland, which were right outside of Berkeley where I went to undergrad. And I didn't even like the music that much, but I started going because my one of my best friends was going and he was saying there's a lot of fun, there's a lot of dancing, it's just crazy, there's lights, it's just like this um, carnival atmosphere. And he struggled to really kind of sell me, but I was like, okay, I mean, I don't have anything going on, I'm going to go. And one of the first times I went, I remember this moment it was in the midst of everything happening. These things, these raves, a lot of them were like underground raves, right? They were off the books kind of things in, in like a warehouse somewhere that you had to go drive to a location. People would be there in kind of like shady van and you'd jump in the van and then they'd drive you to the location. Like it was a funny time in my life, but... Um, I remember at one point in the night, I kind of like looked up, right? And the music was blasting and there was just like the little like lights and like everybody was dancing. There's a whole kind of like uh, collective moment of what Durkheim calls collective effervescence, this energy flowing through everyone. And I remember feeling just, I, I can't even like express in words adequately what I felt in that moment like it was something sublime something that defies language um, happy is one way to describe it joyful um, but yeah there, there was something that we can't really I can't really convey through language right and I think that's something that haunts this research and it's something that Vacant is very uh, aware of from the very beginning that 
no matter what we do and no matter how meticulous and how he says assiduously submit yourself to this world to understand it no matter what we do and the tools that we bring to bear there's always going to be a missing thing there's always going to be something lost that ineffable part of the experience and it might be the emotional sensation that you have in the moment it might be something intensely and microscopic and physical like i described about the feeling of swimming right and having that kind of like sense of the water catching on your fingers right um it might be something something else but there's there's something very precious about the experience itself of throwing yourself into the fire so um that's what that's really what's at stake here and i think this is such a cool book in a way because vacant was one of the first to really put himself into this role um he's not the first to study boxers he's not the first to you know spend a lot of time in a boxing gym documenting what's happening but i contrast this with there's a guy named Norman Mailer, right? Um, how many of you have heard of Norman Mailer? <clears throat> he was a kind of famous American writer. <clears throat> he wrote a lot of fiction, but he also did some nonfiction. And he wrote this book. Uh, let me look up the title. Oh, hold on. Let me look up the title. Norman Mailer. Anybody hear of him? He wrote uh, this book that I, I actually kind of like this book, but it's, it's a great example of what people typically do when they try to study. So here, let me put this up. Here's a book, Only in Passing, The Naked and the Dead. Oh yeah, that's a big book. So Lucas, you sounds like you read a lot. That was a, I think, if I remember correctly, that's a memoir, right? Based on his experience in the, was it the Korean War or the Vietnam War? I can't remember. But yeah. The Naked and the Dead. Yeah, so Norman Mailer, anyways, it doesn't, doesn't matter. He wrote this book called The Fight. All right, let's peek inside. Oh, interestingly, he starts with this idea of carnal indifference, right? So this is a book about Muhammad Ali. Um, yeah, this is a this is a book where he goes and observes Muhammad Ali. Uh, let me see. I, th I can't remember who he was fighting. I'm like uh, blanking now. I believe it was George. Oh, it was George Foreman. I'm glad I didn't say the wrong um, opponent. So it's uh, it's a book where Mailer goes and like kind of observes Muhammad Ali preparing for this big, big championship fight against George Foreman. Um, and it... it it's written from the perspective of a kind of journalistic style where he's sitting there observing him, you know, doing jump rope, hitting the punching bags, training, doing all this stuff from a very kind of up close perspective. And he gets a lot of really interesting insights into the emotions that Ali was going through into the physical nature of his training into even some of his like kind of, um, techniques and how he sort of wins the fights through in the training room. But what he doesn't get at are all these other ineffable parts of the embodiment, right? The emotions, the feel of training, all of that stuff is lost. Um, so there's a kind of interesting challenge that Vacant is throwing down. He's saying, you know, we got to do that. We got to bring this part back in. We've ignored it too long and it, it's to the detriment of sociology. Um, so that's kind of what's at stake there. Any questions about that? And when we take, we're going to take a quick break pretty soon. I'm going to get some more coffee and water. Um, any, any kind of questions or observations?
How do you all, then, actually, before we break, do you think this is something that, do you think it's something that we can, is it possible for us to really represent lived experience? Or are we always kind of chasing this ghost? Is there something ineffable that we can't hope to get at and then we're always just sort of fumbling with words and ways of representing something that we do? There will always be dimensions that cannot be conveyed. Chasing the ghost. Yeah. I think definitely chasing a ghost, but I'm sure better writers can do a better job of it. Yeah. Well, that's that. That's the truth. When there are, when you have a way with words, and you're able to represent things with words, like you, you can get closer. Maybe we're always trying, but we can never really get there. Yeah, there's something kind of. Um, I don't know if that's almost inspiring or maybe a little sad in a sense. Um, but it, it, I, I, I think that the, the takeaway I get is that it's worth trying. Right, that even though we can never really get there, right, even though we're chasing the ghost, that there's still something incredibly valuable. No way to fully explain, says Ryan, only a vague idea. Even the best writers, people's interpretation may not be what they intended. Yeah. Yeah, we can never really get there, right? So there's something... Yeah, I don't know. When you think about it, there's something kind of beautiful about that, that no matter how we try, we can't replicate that experience right there's something just pure about it that defies our attempts at representing definitely a good thing that there's something about the human experience that cannot be fully captured in words but i agree it is a worthwhile pursuit yeah no i i agree too i think that it's um this is why it's precious right that you can't fully convey it um but it's it's worth exploring and um I think that's kind of like the take I get from this book, right? We have to try. Even though we're not going to get there, we have to try. It's something that we can't ignore because it is such a fundamental part of our existence. Okay, it's 10.01 now. Let's come back at 10.10. We're going to talk about Busy Louie, the fight night, and then I'm going to put the gi on. Actually, I might even come back in the gi so I don't have to do a change. But uh, And then we're going to learn some really, really basic stuff. And it'll, it'll kind of hone in on some of these ideas about carnal sociology. All right, so see you at about 1010. All right, so I'm going to put this little be right back sign. And if you're watching on Zoom, you'll just see the background over here. All right, see you all in about 10.
Okay, I'm back. I'm back. How's everybody? How's it? How was everybody's break? Let's get a quick uh, snack check. I got a uh, espresso. Espresso and water. What did everybody else? Did anybody else get a snack? Water. Good. Just got some water. Good. Water is always good. Stay hydrated as a side note in the midst of this heat. Matcha. Oh, Ryan, you're you're like a real tea aficionado, huh? Nice, Yuhan. What kind of cookie? Chocolate chip? Snickerdoodle? Chocolate cookie. Oh, nice, nice. Peanut butter. There's so many good cookies. Water only. That's that's good though, honestly. I I had a regular breakfast and before teaching today, I had the last little piece. Uh, my wife bought a... Uh, I don't know if you've all ever heard of this place, but it's called Uncle Tetsu's um, Cheesecake. It's like a Japanese style cheesecake. It's very like light and fluffy. I don't know. I was having an espresso and I saw it in the refrigerator and I was like, oh, maybe, maybe before teaching. But, you know, obviously not the healthiest option. <laughs> Coffee and water. Amazing, Sabrina. That's the that's the combo. Good pairing, it is. I can't have cheesecake alone. It has to be paired with a coffee of some sort. Some yogurt, Relix, nice. Flavored, plain. Fruit. Yeah, I love yogurt. Full of good probiotics for gut health. Anyhow, welcome back. Welcome back. We're going to get into... Uh, the latter part of today's reading, and then I'm going to introduce you to some very, very kind of basic stuff that is actually very important that gets us into our journey into carnal sociology, all right? Um, as subsequent weeks go by, I'll be teaching you more, um, more moves and more things that will be part of your final assignment. Uh, but today's lesson is going to be very kind of big picture. So don't worry. It's not like I'm throwing you into the fire. Hi, I was just wondering if the live video is on currently or are we just using the chat? Uh, Lucy, what do you mean by that? I'm a little... The video... I, can you see me? Can you, you? You all can see me, right? My video is on. Oh, are you are you watching from Zoom? I could not see Prof for some reason. Oh, it's well, maybe it was because you came when we were having a break. <clears throat> there was a a ten minute break. Yeah, we took a break from like 10.01 to 10.10 to get like a coffee or I guess some of you had some food as well. But you can see me now, right, Lucy? That's that's kind of like, a, I guess, what matters. <clears throat> you I'm I'm a little confused, but is every everything is good then? Yeah, like on your side. Yeah, can you see and hear me now, Lucy? This is good to check because sometimes uh, when you're streaming, there's little technical issues. So uh, I always want to stay on top of that. You can't see me. You can't see me now. Um, 
that might be something on your end. Um, maybe try refreshing or watching on a browser or um, try opening it up in the app. If, if you can't access that way, the uh, Zoom stream is also live. So you have like a few different options, but yeah, sometimes refreshing might help. Um, yeah, or maybe rejoining. So it might just be like a little technical thing, but hopefully, hopefully it works. And for those who have any kind of technical difficulties, I'll be recording the VODs and then posting them also in Quirkus and in Discord. So you'll have the option to rewatch. Okay. So I just want to go over a couple quick things about the latter part of the book and then we'll get into the carnal part. Okay. So today... This lesson is going to be kind of big picture stuff about martial arts, but it's going to be an interesting theme that we return to at the end of the course um, as we talk about um, your final assignment. Okay, so here's something that drew a lot of criticism in Vacant's book. Okay, in the in the part the prologue, he talks about his initiatory immersion, right, of how he fell in love with boxing, how he threw himself into the fire, started training every day. And he, he, you know, he really became a convert in some ways, but people have had mixed responses to this, this part. He writes, I gradually got taken in by the game to the point where I ended up spending all my afternoons at the Woodlawn gym and gloving up with the professionals from the club on a regular basis before climbing through the ropes, ropes for my first official fight in the Chicago Golden Gloves. In the intoxication of immersion, I even thought for a while of aborting my academic career to quote unquote turn pro and thereby remain with my friends from the gym and its coach, D.D. Armour, who had become a second father for me. All right. So I have heard some people say they felt like this was, well, let me not even put that out there. How do you all feel by this? Do you believe what he says um, or do you have some doubts or reservations about what he's saying here? And I don't know why this keeps, the audio here keeps changing on my mic. It's super weird. Lucas says, I could see this aspect being criticized because he's abandoning the role of the impartial observer. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, Lucas, your question is really great because it actually kind of forces us to confront this idea. Is there a such thing as an impartial observer? Is that even possible? Right? Certainly within science, there's this presumption that we use these methods, we use our, our ways of collecting data to uh, guard against bias to guard against partiality in the way that we collect information and data about a world and then convey that to others. But is, is that even possible? It's an interesting question to ponder. Now, I'll, I'll kind of put it out there because I think maybe nobody's jumped in yet, but some people have said they felt like they didn't, they didn't believe this part. I've heard from people at conferences and kind of in discussing this book over the years that some people have said they, they have a hard time kind of taking this part seriously. Um, so this is a, he, he did this as his dissertation at the University of Chicago. And after finishing his dissertation, he had a, I think he, right afterwards, although I could be wrong about his sort of, his institutional timeline, he had an invitation to join um, the Harvard Society of Fellows, which is a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University, kind of, seen as the most, one of the most prestigious postdoctoral fellowships for a social scientist. Um, so I think people 
the critique some people have is that they say, I don't know, I feel like <clears throat> this is him kind of overselling or overstating how much he fell in love with boxing. Um, and I, I feel, I, I see that critique and there's another part of me that feels a little ambivalent because I, you know, have had similar thoughts about jujitsu, not, not like serious thoughts, um, especially now as a parent and you have somebody else in a family that kind of depends on you. But there have been moments where I'm, you know, taken by martial arts and I think to myself, it's the one thing outside of my family life where I go and it's like something that's just pure joy. It's something that I enjoy doing all the time. Um, so I can kind of empathize with a person who gets so immersed that they think about like, wow, this life is, is, is in some ways better than one where I'm sitting at a desk writing articles and teaching and so forth. Lucas says, maybe it's not 100% possible to be impartial, but he is abandoning that notion altogether instead of at least striving. Hmm, that's a fair critique. Yeah, he's kind of leaning into his own subjectivity in this book. And I think he's kind of coming at this from the perspective that um, there's really no way to be impartial and that uh, in, in reality, the experiences you bring and your own kind of individual experience are something also valuable to 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 kind of document um so i i don't know i find this to be an interesting passage and i highlighted it because i think it kind of gets at the challenge that ethnographers face sometimes of talking about their own role in collecting data you know people like to talk about their relationship to others and they, they or let me put it this way are you more likely to take someone's account seriously if it seems like they really really got into the field and they spend a lot of time there and it was like a part of their life or at the opposite extreme if it seems like they just sort of parachute in really briefly and then they leave like which which account are you more likely to take seriously Lucas says, I didn't really meet this passage with skepticism when reading. Maybe his more artful writing style makes it difficult for some to take this passage seriously. Hmm, that could be true. Yeah, no, he talks about gloving up, right? Intoxication of immersion, aborting his career to turn pro. Um, there is a little bit of like artistic license in the way he's talking about this. Um, but so I, I feel torn as somebody who has trained martial arts. And it's like something that I, I feel is, is very much a part of my identity in my life where I don't like to go more than like a couple days without training martial arts, um, whether it's jujitsu or judo, more jujitsu. But I, I, I'm starting to kind of develop that deep love for judo as well. Um, so I, I get that part, you know, I get that part, but. I think people are kind of skeptical. They think like, oh, this might just be a way that he's trying to show he was really in in deep with the guys at the gym as a way to kind of uh <clears throat> as a way to kind of like legitimize his role as a dedicated observer of this phenomenon of this field. Um so I don't know. I, I kind of like get what he's saying, but I, I think some people find it hard to believe that he would seriously consider leaving academia and all of the different opportunities he had in that field to quote unquote go pro. Um, but again, I, I, I don't read it that skeptically because if you've ever been really, really into a sport, um, you know, sometimes you can fall in love with something and be convinced that this is your calling, your vocation in life. Um, even if your chances or your odds of becoming pro are, are slim, um, maybe there's something, again, ineffable and intoxicating, as he says, about the experience itself that is hard for an outsider to kind of fully um, appreciate, right? Have any of you, let me pause this and ask you all, have any of you had things that you do where you, you kind of feel the same way, where you're like, well, maybe, maybe one day I'll abandon this whole academic 
enterprising and do this other thing that I really love, even if it doesn't make sense to outsiders. There's nothing like being really into a sport, especially if you're a competitive person. Yeah, exactly. Like it's a, it's a hard thing to kind of like understand and fathom from the outside. But if you really, really fall in love with a sport, like it can become your whole world, your identity, everything is wrapped up into it. Olivia says, I don't know. I feel like those that are skeptical have their own biases towards what is considered an acceptable career. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the people who are skeptical haven't had that kind of uh, immersion and, and maybe they also put academia on a, a bit of a pedestal and think and, and find it kind of hard to understand why anybody would want to abandon academia for something else that's more precarious. Yeah, fair enough. That's a fair critique. Ryan says, I was in a situation like this before coming to UFT. Oh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> can you, are you able to share any other, any, any more about that, Ryan? Cause that's very interesting too. It kind of validates Vacant's uh, way of talking about his work. I feel like, I don't know if I've ever been in a position there, there's been moments where I've kind of thought about other careers as well, um, but it, it's hard when you have a family, like the, the life of a martial arts, kind of like to own a gym, to teach, it's more of a labor of love. It's hard pragmatically to make that work. Kind of says, just getting a degree for my parents and planning to start a business of my own. I see. So, so do you, you, you felt this as well, kind of this kind of like idea that maybe academia, like the business route, Ryan says, I was playing in the Taiwanese soccer league in high school. Ah, oh, okay. So you were kind of like debating, do you just go all in with soccer or do you then go and get an education? Yeah, I see. Interesting. Right. So you, you, you probably empathize with what Vacant is saying. And I think maybe in, in going back to your colleague's point, maybe some of the skeptics are people who have kind of these own biases about um, acceptable careers and what academia really is. Um, Andrew says, I think academia has changed from a love of learning to getting a paper to get a job means to an end versus enjoying the journey. So there have been passions I think I would love to pursue outside of academics. Oh, that's a good way to put it, yeah. I, I, I think honestly, the people who are critical to go back to Olivia's point are sometimes maybe not being honest and forthcoming about some of the challenges in academia itself too. It's not all roses. It's a, it's a great career if it can work out for you. And there's a lot of things that I am grateful for, but that's not to say that everyday things, everything in academia is just this um, perfect idyllic world either, right? So you can kind of see why somebody might fall in love with this improbable um, career that's very different, very removed from, um, you know, academia, this very cerebral and sort of disembodied life, right? Like think about what, a typical day in the life of an academic is, right? Teaching, excluding teaching, what does it really involve? It means you're sitting at a desk, usually alone, usually typing, usually reading. Um, it's a life of a kind of, a very kind of disembodied life in a way. Um, Olivia says, I think many people mourn the loss of their passions due to quote unquote respectability. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's about a, that's about a, as real of a truth bomb on a Thursday morning as you can get, right? <laughs> I need some hydration after being hit with that little mini existential crisis, courtesy of Olivia. <laughs> no, but that's real. That's real. So I think, I think the critiques are a little bit unfair, but I can also understand people would be like, well, you, you've achieved, you're, you're kind of at the pinnacle of academic, you, a, a, of the kind of like journey, you know, you have this invitation to do this um, prestigious postdoc and you're going to have the support of all these mentors and 
all this stuff. Why would you, why would you maybe think of leaving that for boxing? Something that's very precarious. Um, so I think I, yeah, you know, to go off of your, some of these points, I think maybe some of these critiques have a sort of inbuilt class bias, social class bias, where the, the notion of academia is climbing the ladder in academia is kind of seen as the pinnacle and everything else is kind of, um, not as, not as worthy of a, of a, of a career, but I think I think I, I take what he says and I, I think that there's something there. He he probably really got into it and like enjoyed the process and 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 really just kind of fell into it. So the part that we, we read today um was the what he calls a sociological novella. Um and he says that there's something beautiful about the gym. He says that there's an egalitarian ethos, right? So here let me put this up. All right here. So he writes a little bit about being an outsider and he says, you know, part of him being one of the only white guys at the gym um, was mediated by the fact that he was French. So he wasn't a white guy from the U.S. immersing himself into this gym. He was a white guy from France. So there was a kind of like a little bit of a different status as an outsider. Um, But he says that he overcomes some of these racial social class differences through his full immersion, right? Through quote unquote, paying his dues in the ring. And I, and I totally get this part. I think that anytime you train martial arts, any kind of martial arts, people respect you if you really go into it and you do it right. And I think we can do a thought experiment, how different this project would have been if he just sat in the gym and watched people and observed them and interviewed them, he would still learn quite a bit. But I think that his relationship with people at the gym would be very different, right? They respected him because he was getting punched in the face and he was punching and he was training with them. He was going through some of the arduous um, training. He was running like miles and miles in the morning, sometimes in bad weather, right? We've all seen like have you all seen like these uh, boxing montage movies like in Rocky, right? He's running through the streets of Philadelphia. Like there's quite a bit of conditioning that goes into even being an amateur boxer, let alone someone who wants to go pro. So he develops a kind of healthy amount of respect from his peers because he's willing to immerse himself, right? So that's another kind of, uh, I guess, uh, justification for doing carnal sociology. Not only are you kind of recovering this lost part of our 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 um, existence, right? Not only are you capturing the ineffable experience, uh, but it also probably helps you build rapport with people. They see you sweating, bleeding, and feeling all of the pain and the and the kind of challenge of of training, and that that kind of builds a, a, a level of respect, right? It makes people sort of warm up to you more. Um, he gets into, so busy Louie at the golden gloves is his story basically of him getting ready to fight. And I have a lot of respect for him that he went and did this. Um, <clears throat> I've competed before in jujitsu, which is kind of similar in a way, right? You're, um, put into a mat and you have to face somebody you've never met before. You don't know what kind of techniques they like, what kind of things they do, their tendencies, um, how they're going to try and come at you and submit you. Um, And it is nerve wracking, right? It is the most anxious and nervous I've ever felt in my life. I, I competed throughout my youth, high school and in college as a competitive swimmer. Um, I've done public speaking in front of large audiences, uh, on TV and, and documentaries. Um, I've done a lot of things that are nerve wracking, but nothing, nothing quite captures the feeling of standing on in the ring or, or in Vacant's case, or on a, a mat in the case of like grappling across from somebody anticipating the start of a controlled fight. 
right? It's a very unique sensation to, to be faced with that. Um, so I have a lot of respect that Vacant um, jumped in the ring. And he says, he calls it kind of like becoming a boxer is, is sort of like entering a religious order. He says that, you know, again, throughout his writing in this chapter, he talks about it almost like becoming a monk. Like he starts to talk about refraining from um, lots of activities outside of the gym to get ready, right? He talks about uh, getting rid of cleaning his diet up, training himself. Um, he also talks about refraining from sexual activity, right? Which is a big part of the sense making of boxers. They, they talk about how having sex before a fight drains you of your vitality and energy and you're not ready to actually go in and fight. Right. So he, he really like kind of takes this seriously. Um, he brackets, brackets so much of his life to get ready. Um, I think here's an interesting point. I just want to highlight. He talks about the gym's meaning to people at, at the gym. He has like a couple different metaphors that I think are very interesting. Um, let me see. Okay, so first he calls the gym a lair. It's a, it's a place where you seek refuge. You bracket a moment, a life that you no longer find even unfair because you're so used to it, so weary of it. Here he's talking about the meaning of the Woodlawn Gym for the young black men who are going there right? Um, it's a, it's a place, it's a, it's a place of refuge, um, from a, a, a broader society in which people experience discrimination. They live in conditions of poverty and post-industrial Chicago, right? He describes some of this in the book itself, but basically it's this kind of escape. It's this respite from the harshness of life. He also describes the gym as an antidote to the street. He says that the gym is a place that keeps people out of trouble. It kind of places them into this different kind of sociability, right? Every hour spent behind the walls of the club is another hour snatched away from the sidewalks of 63rd Street, right? So it's this place and a lot of the members and a lot of the guys he trains with talks about how they might have been dead or in jail or in uh, other kinds of trouble if it, if it weren't for the, the gym, right? So the gym provides a kind of social structure in a place where um, the state has removed its, its kind of influence and its support for marginalized people, right? So it's, it's this kind of like world of, into a, unto itself that structures the lives of precarious young men. And it's also what he calls a dream machine. It's a place that young people who are coming of age in difficult, very challenging circumstances can envision a future, can see themselves achieving great things, right? Um, he says it doesn't matter because in the meantime, the gym is a machine that pulls you out of indifference, out of in inexistence. And he later says, to be somebody, that's what it's all about, to escape from anonymity, anonymity from dreariness, if only for the space of a few rounds, right? A boxer in the ring is a being who screams with all his heart, with all his body, I want to be someone, I exist, who is dying to be seen, known, recognized, even if only as a last resort by people from the neighborhood, friends or kids in the vicinity, right? So the gym is this place that helps build the esteem of its members. It gives people who go there a positive outlet, a way to be known for their skills and not to, you know, so it, it becomes some, to be somebody, to be able to be recognized, right? Not to kind of fade into anonymity. So here's another kind of existential theme, right? I think all of us share this kind of like universal um, desire to be seen to be recognized, to, to have something that we can be proud of, to feel um, exalted in moments for doing things that require skill and effort, right? To, to, to have respect of our peers, to have people think of us um, as people who are worthy of that kind of respect, right? So it's a, it's a machine where most of these guys are not going to be pro. They're not going to be the next champions, right? In, in fact, he talks about there's only really a handful at the gym who, who become pro, but it's still something that in those moments of sparring, of fighting, of preparing for a fight, 
of punching the bags, of jump roping, that these young men are feeling themselves, um, they, they feel differently about themselves in these moments, right? It's a, a place that helps build people's esteem. Um, and that's especially important in um, the United States in hyper-segregated places like Chicago, right? Um, places where you have the legacy of Jim Crow racism, where black people were not allowed to frequent the same restaurants or drink from the same uh, water fountains, where uh, there was a, a kind of world of separate and deeply, deeply unequal worlds that people of color could occupy and exist in, right? So Chicago, 1990, early 1990s, is a laboratory for the downstream effects of racism and deindustrialization, right? So during the 70s, a lot of the jobs that people would get to support themselves in places like Chicago, Philadelphia, elsewhere, are moved overseas. And a lot of the jobs that you could get that could help you make ends meet are no longer there, right? And the jobs that replace them are not great jobs. They're service sector jobs, jobs where there's not a lot of respect that comes from working at McDonald's or working in the service industries. Not that there's anything wrong with those jobs, but these are not jobs that are perceived as being um, something that's uh, esteem building. So the gym is this space where people can build a sense of esteem. And it reminds me, let me see if I have the book here. Yeah, I do. My colleague, um, David Trui. Uh, actually, I might not be saying that completely right. He has a French last name, Trui, maybe. He wrote this book called Football in the Park. He has a similar point. His, his, his ethnography is about um, immigrant men who play soccer, pick up soccer with each other in Los Angeles. And part of the same theme comes through in his book. He talks about how the men at this park regale each other with stories about goals that they score and how in these moments, right, when they celebrate a win or celebrate scoring, they're kind of lifted out of this sense of in, indifference, in existence, as Vacant calls it, right? There are these sort of sublime moments that help um, explain why people are so drawn to this activity, right? So irrespective of the probability of going pro, there's something intrinsically um, endearing and, and precious about um, participating in this, in this world, right? It's to be somebody. I think we can all kind of appreciate that. Do you all have examples of things where you, you receive validation for doing something and how that kind of affects your, your, your sense of self, right? I can speak about it in the martial arts sense. And here, let me put on my... Here. Brownie, you gotta watch out, buddy. In jujitsu, most of us are not gonna go pro. The vast majority of the people who you train with in the dojo are not there to compete. But there's still these moments after you train with somebody where you submit them or you get a good sweep or um, you, maybe you throw them, where that becomes kind of part of your local identity and it becomes part of this esteem building. Right. And for some people who have jobs, careers, lives, whose race, ethnicity, class, gender um, affords them esteem and other aspects of their lives, maybe it's just another added sort of perk to training martial arts. But for people who are depleted in all of these other aspects of their lives, you know, the training, the, the fighting, the the, the, the act of immersing into the, the martial art can mean so much more. It can be so um, incredibly important in, that, in those ways. Can anybody, does anybody have an example of that, of something like, you know, people might even experience this in the video game world, right? I, I, I was thinking about this during the pandemic. I played a lot of this game called Apex Legends with people, and I never really even got that great. I got to diamond rank, which... I guess it's kind of higher than it is higher than other ranks. But, you know, my friends and I, we would like post stories on our Instagram about getting to this rank. And it was sort of like this 
cause for celebration. Yeah, we hit diamond on Apex Legends as if that was some kind of big deal. But it, it doesn't matter that it wasn't a, a big deal in the kind of grand scheme of things. It was like a big deal to us because it made us feel sort of like we have these skills. Um, so Wakanda is really getting at that. Okay. So now, uh, let me see. I have to switch this. We're going to do a little exercise now. So wherever you are, um, okay. Hold on. My dog is here. Okay. I know. I know you want to go up here. Here. Why don't you say hi real quick? Hello. <laughs> All right, so can everybody still hear me okay? Everybody hear me okay? Let me put this down. Yeah, okay. So, nice. Okay, so one of the most important um, Things that we're going to talk about this semester from a carnal sense is your balance, right? And most martial arts and more specifically jujitsu and judo are martial arts that um, put you deeply, deeply in touch with your balance and your opponent's balance, okay? So one of the kind of things I want you to do, so if wherever you are in your, hopefully, like, do you have a place where you can kind of just stand up in your house? So just stand up wherever you are, all right? Okay, stand up wherever you are, and I just want you to kind of like stand with your, your legs at a shoulder width distance apart, all right? Kind of don't have space here but this is just more of a kind of like big picture lesson and one of the kind of things that you learn from the very jump in both judo and jujitsu is that where the head goes the body follows okay so we're we're talking a lot of this week about kind of mind body and this is another sort of example of that a very carnal example of mind body Okay, so where your head goes, your body follows. Now, in judo, for example, all of the throws in judo begin with this thing called kazushi. Kazushi in Japanese basically kind of like breaks down into breaking of the balance, right? So anytime you want to throw somebody or in jiu-jitsu, if you want to sweep them, if you're on your back and you want to sweep them and knock them over, you have to use kazushi. Kazushi means you're making the person lose their balance momentarily. When people lose their balance, there is a small window of opportunity where you can take them down or again sweep them, um, cause them to fall. So I want you just to stand where you are and, and play with balance and be attend to your head. So take your head and I want you to kind of like lean forward a little bit and then feel your weight shifting forward before you lose your balance, okay? Obviously, I don't want you to like crash into the wall or break anything, but the idea is I want you to sort of feel how your head begins to drift forward, drifts backwards to the side, right? You can feel moments where your balance begins to break. There's that little very subtle breaking point, right? So try all directions. Try, try, try the four directions. So like imagine the uh, if you've ever played like old school Nintendo, there's the, the control pad was a T, was like a cross. Forward, right, losing balance, backwards, losing balance, to the side, losing balance, and now this way, to the side, losing balance, right? Here I'm losing balance, right? Have you all had a chance to do that now? Do you feel your, your balance? Let me see if I can go over this way. I have more, more, a little more space over here to stand. <laughs> okay. 
Do you feel that little moment where the head kind of separates from the core, right? It comes forward a little bit and you start to lose your balance, right? That's Kazushi. And all of the throws in Judo play on that notion of Kazushi, okay? So in Judo, the standard grip is you get a collar and a sleeve and you hold the person like this, collar sleeve. And a lot of the Kazushi is like this. I'm pulling you forward like this with my hand on the collar, pulling you this way, hand on the sleeve, pulling you this way, right? So it's this, this motion, right? This, if there, imagine someone standing in front of me here, I have kind of like, I'm grabbing a collar and a sleeve. I'm pulling them this way towards me, towards my body, boom, right? That the collar hand is pulling their head off, off uh, uh, of, of the kind of back of your feet onto the balls of your feet. The sleeve is adding to that. It's yanking you out of your, your sort of like comfortable base, right? And there's different directions you can go. You can also push, right? So imagine like just uh, if we were in person, I'd have you standing kind of like next to each other and you just sort of like touch each other's hands, like give a little gentle nudge and you can feel your balance breaking, right? That's one of the drills we sometimes do to kind of help people develop a sense sensitivity to balance. It's like that little hand to hand, it's almost like you're giving each other a high 10, like, hey, good job. And you give a little jolt and you can feel your, the balance go off. Where the head goes, the body's following, right? So all of the Kazushi from Judo, grabbing the, the, the collar, um, whatever the, the kind of collar you have on, it could be a jacket even, a sweater, sleeve, is to pull the person off of their balance, right? Now, can anybody think of what happens when you pull somebody off of your balance? Why is it easier to throw them? Can anybody think of that? Why would it be easier to throw when you pull them off balance? <laughs> Just cover the back. Any, any uh, idea? Because they aren't able to pull back and stabilize, says Sabrina. They're unstable, yeah. So they're not able to kind of like, right? Like when we walk, when you walk, um, or I shouldn't say when we walk, I'd say it, like if you are able-bodied, right? and you don't have like significant physical impairments, um, you're walking in a way where your head is kind of almost always at some point connected to a, lot, a big part of your body. Now, obviously that changes quite a bit if you have impairments and so forth, but short of those impairments and everybody has a little bit of a different gait, right? Everybody's walk is a little bit different. Um, your head is kind of like the center of your balance and it's connected to your hips, right? Your core, right? If this is pulled off in any direction, you start to lose your balance. Now, the other reason, yeah, so they become lighter, right? So a lot of the judo, and you're gonna learn a little bit of this, but more of it is gonna be conceptual. We pull people off weight because it's hard to deadlift someone, right? If somebody is just sort of like planting down really heavily, and they're kind of like sitting on their hips and they're sort of like, you know, really gripping the ground and trying to be like a dead weight, right? There's that kind of folks saying a dead weight is very hard to lift. It's, it's extremely difficult. Like you have to like almost throw your back out trying to carry something if it's firmly, firmly planted. But the curious thing about martial arts and judo sensibility and jujitsu sensibility is that <coughs> When you make a person fall off balance, they become lighter, right? And it's easier now because they're moving uh, to lift them and to throw them. So in a lot of throws, for example, in judo, I'm pulling, you pull the person off their weight, they get, you pull them onto their tiptoes, they're unstable, as Olivia says, and then you drop your hips underneath, 
to lift and throw, okay? So the, the kind of big picture really is not, I don't care necessarily about you learning how to throw per se. I, I might, I'm gonna show you throughout this semester some of the basic mechanics of throwing and some, some other little basic stuff about jujitsu. But big picture, carnal sociology. I have to pull the person off. They have to be on their tiptoes or they have to be off balance and they become lighter. They become lighter to lift and throw, right? And there's a very narrow window of opportunity. As soon as you lift somebody off their balance, if I then settle back down and plant again, that moment is lost, it's fleeting, right? That moment of Kazushi is fleeting, right? So there's a kind of like urgency. Once you have a person off balance, you have a very narrow window to attack. And that's when you have to go for it. And one of the big mistakes I see a lot of beginners making, and I was actually correcting somebody yesterday in jujitsu, um, who's kind of new. They grab here, low on the lapel, and they try to like use this. Can anybody think of why this is a bad grip? Why it's not an ideal grip if you want to break someone's balance? They were grabbing kind of like down here and just yanking like this. Closer to the center of balance, exactly. And what, what is it further away from? They were grabbing like this, hoping to break their balance. What is this away from? They were going like this and going like, why can't I um, break their, their posture? Why am I having such a hard time breaking posture from here? The head, exactly, Sabrina. That's why we grab here, right at the collarbone, at the neck, right? Because now, now if you if you yank somebody's collar like this, their head falls forward, right? Um, this is very close to the center of your gravity. I can like, if you if you really get at someone's collar, you can kind of like whip them around and like really throw them off balance. Yeah, so too far from the head. It's it's annoying. Right, having someone pulling like this, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna create the kazushi that we want, right? So kazushi is a concept that comes out of judo. Um, Jigaro Kano, who is the creator of judo, wrote extensively about kazushi. We're gonna talk about kazushi a lot. Kazushi is kind of a um, concept in grappling-based martial arts, in judo, jiu-jitsu. Uh, it's also used in other martial arts as well, Aikido, for example. Um, but it's also kind of a bigger metaphor for life, right? When you feel unstable and out of balance, like it's easier for you to get thrown or for easier for you to kind of experience catastrophe, right? So it's, it's about being firmly grounded and, and having that kind of awareness, right? And once you lose that, it becomes easier to get thrown. Okay. So, let me come back here. That's, that's the lesson today, all right? So the main thing I want you to take from today is the, the discussion we had about the kind of ineffable side of experience. Um, I want you to kind of develop an appreciation for carnal sociology. Um, I want you to kind of ponder and think about whether, you, whether or not you think it's possible. Remember we described, can we ever really, really, truly, and fully represent experience or, or are we always kind of like chasing the ghost? And then in the kind of carnal, practical application side, I want you to think about your head as the center of your balance, okay? And then maybe just today, just kind of walk around and try to like spend even like 30 seconds just being sort of more aware of your balance and how much it's connected to your head, okay? All right, so that's all we have time for today. Next week, we're gonna get into uh, historical readings that get us kind of at where both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo come from and how Judo kind of emerges in this very, very interesting moment in history at a, at a crossroads, in fact, all right? So, come here, Brandon. Let's say bye. Oh, he's not happy about this. He's not happy, folks. But it's been great having you in class. Thanks so much for participating today. It's a remote class, and it's been made a lot easier because you all are chiming in, right? So...
Thanks so much for coming through today. Hope you have a good rest of your day. I'll put Brownie back because he did not like being taken from his little favorite spot. But have a good rest of your afternoon. Stay cool. Um, and yeah, enjoy the readings. Okay, thank you all. Have a good one. Take care. See you next time. Peace.